Good to be here this morning. Amen. Appreciate all the help I've had while I've been gone, preaching and teaching. It's been a great help and to have good people that can fill in for you and, uh, and good faithful people who love the Lord and they love the Word of God. Turn to the book of Daniel this morning, chapter number 2. Daniel is one of the most maligned of all the prophets. Daniel chapter number 2. All of the so-called scholars, most of them anyway, say Daniel was written after the fact. That there is no way that someone could see the Gentile kingdoms as they unfolded like he sees them here in Daniel. Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number 34 Thou sawest till a stone was cut out with hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Now, this is a classic uh, prophecy of the destruction of the Gentile kingdoms at the second coming of Christ. Christ is the stone cut out of the mountain. And the stone that the builders rejected, he smites the image on its feet, Note carefully, how many toes do you have on your feet? Mm -hmm. Ten. Now look at Daniel chapter number 7 and verse 7. Daniel 7, 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, stamped the residue of the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts, that were before it, and it had ten horns. The number ten showing up again. Verse number 24, chapter 7 of the book of Daniel. Verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, he shall subdue Three kings, he who? The Antichrist. Go back to verse number 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, making a reference to the fourth beast. We're talking about Gentile kingdoms and we're talking about the rise of the Antichrist and he is connected with the number ten. Now don't you turn to the book of Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. Now, don't dismiss Bible numerology as a, as a fad or as a, as a thing that really doesn't uh, matter. It matters a lot. Bible numerology is a very important thing. Daniel 12, verse, I mean, Revelation 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads. And note carefully, how many horns? Ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Look at chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. And verse number 3. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, having the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Here we go. Ten, 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 ten. Chapter number 17 and verse number 7. The angel said to me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I'll tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Then in chapter number 17 and verse number 12, the divine text says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast or with the Antichrist. Then finally in verse number 16, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. 
Over and over and over again, the number 10 is connected with the Antichrist and with the rise of his kingdom. In 1968, a group was formed by the Morgenthau Group for the purpose of accelerating the plans to have the new world order in place by the year 2000. The Club of Rome developed a plan to divide the world into 10 regions or kingdoms. That's quite remarkable. 10 regions or kingdoms. Now, you have to, I've got a map, and you, you can find the map online. All you'd have to do is type in the Club of Rome, and, and it'll give you a map of the 10 kingdoms that are the 10 areas, or the 10 sections that the whole world has been divided into. This Club of Rome was the, was the, uh, the, the originating force behind what's called the European Union. The Maastricht Treaty in 1992, February the 7th, was ratified, which created a European Union. This purpose was to integrate Europe and to bring together a United States of Europe. And the terminology, of course, down through the years has changed in various ways. But the European Union was a product, make no mistake about this, now make no mistake about this, was a product of globalist, one-worlders, no doubt whatsoever. The purpose of the European Union was to establish a one-world government. Now, the Club of Rome still has a website. You can get on it. And it says the EU Charter, European Union Charter, the Club of Rome EU Charter aims to build bridges. What uh, politician in America running for office right now talks about bridges and not walls? aims to build bridges between the institutions of the European Union, EU member state constituencies, EU citizens, and the Club of Rome as a leading think tank at world level. Its mission is to act as a catalyst for reflection on sustainable development in Europe. There's that buzzword, sustainable development. What's that called? Uh, 21, what was that called? Agenda 21. In plain words, they can come into your country and begin to exercise sovereignty over your sovereignty and establish a foothold in sovereign nations and use a straw man, which is sustainable development, as the pretense or the pretext for doing it. What they do is create a, they create a, uh, a crisis, created crisis, not a real one, but a created crisis, for example, global warming. They create a crisis, and then by creating the crisis, they create the solution. If you don't agree with them on their created crisis, you are blackballed, demonized, and with political correctness rendered null and void from that day on. And you're kicked out of the academic uh, uh, debate and academic circles, and you're finished. This is the way these vicious one-world globalists are operating. They are vicious people. They intend to ram down your throat a one-world government and a one-world religion, and your say-so in the matter is irrelevant. These are the elite think tank Club of Rome. They know what's better for you than you know what's better for you. And, of course, these people are satanically inspired. They're filled with the, with the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. And their purpose is to thwart the second advent of Christ and his kingdom, which is coming down to this world, and it's on its way. And the Lord will show up just exactly as, uh, as he said he would. Now, uh, and he's coming. And, and, uh, and, and as I see these things begin to unfold, I have to ask myself the question, how long will it be? Now, of course, you understand what I'm doing here this morning. I'm laying the groundwork for what has just happened in Great Britain. Uh, here is a map of the 10 sections that the world has been sectioned off into. 
10 sections. I don't remember how many countries. got 260, 270, 60, 70, 80, 90 countries in the world, all right? But that all of this down to 10 regions or 10 sections. Now, it makes you wonder, why did they choose the number 10? They could have chosen 11th, 12, or what, but they chose 10. It could be that the Almighty makes them choose certain numbers in fulfillment of prophecy. Is this the fulfillment of Daniel 2? I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying it's quite a coincidence, don't you think? Now, what just happened in Great Britain was called Brexit. And Brexit uh, hasn't been, they haven't said a lot about it in the country, here, this country, uh, the news media probably for a number of reasons. Before the vote took place, I think it was this past Thursday, they did, uh, they did some polling, oh, some polls over there, some, uh, 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 is that what you call it when you do a, when you, what do they call it when they, when they, uh, when you, when you, when you check people before they vote? My mind's not working good this morning. Exit polling. I mean, they take polls. They take polls. You know, they ask them questions. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got an election coming up. But how would you vote on this? How would you vote on that? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? And so they were taking polls in Great Britain. And all of the polls pointed to the country staying in the European Union. As a matter of fact, some of the polls were far. I mean, they were... Uh, strong in favor of Great Britain staying in the European Union. Lesson number one, forget the polls. You can manipulate numbers any way you please. They've got a message and they'll manipulate it. What do I mean by that? Forget them here too. Forget them here. The only poll that matters is when you walk into that voting booth and, and pull that switch and vote for whoever you're going to vote for. That's the poll that matters because that's the one that counts. But anyway, they did all this polling over there in Great Britain, and they were genuinely shocked to find out that the British people, by over a four-point margin, rejected membership in the, in the European Union and voted to pull out, and Great Britain retain its sovereignty once again as a sovereign nation. A lot of issues involved that has to do with trade, Issues are involved that has to do with the governance of the country. Issues involved that has to do with the influx of all of these migrants that are coming from Syria and other parts of the world. And the vast majority of them are Muslims. And I don't know if you keep up much with the news at all. And, uh, and, and you have to be careful with your source of news. If you go to CBS, NBC, and ABC, the mainline uh, news organizations of this country, you will get fed a constant diet of liberalism and a tainted view, and you're, lonely, and, and you're not going to get anything. But Europe is experiencing one of the most profound social upheavals that it ever has in its existence. People are being raped on the street. People are being murdered. They're being robbed. And most of this is taking place by these immigrants that are coming into the country. They're coming into the country, and, uh, and the people of Great Britain, uh, the other day I saw uh, Boris. I don't know too much about him, but they say he may put potentially be the next prime minister of Great Britain over David Cameron, who has resigned and, and will step out of office uh, soon. But in any event, I'm not in it. That's, that's not an issue, rather. The issue is this. He was standing in front of a huge billboard, and I watched this on BBC. You know, I didn't hear it from anybody. I just watch it. He, stand, he or she or whoever it was was standing in front of a huge billboard. And you know what was on that billboard? It was a photograph that had been blown up to something like 16 feet wide. It was a photograph of hundreds of thousands of migrants coming into Great Britain and into Europe. In other words, that was a profound issue in Great Britain it was the influx of all of these Muslims into their country. And they knew that if they didn't do something to take their country back, that it wouldn't be long before they would literally be bred out of existence. Because if they can't beat you with armies, they'll come in and they'll infiltrate and they'll come in, they'll breed, and they breed like rabbits. And they will overthrow. Now, you hear me up here talking this morning. If you are a brainwashed American liberal, you think I am a racist bigot. Immediately. 
You do. And you're going to turn me off and you're not going to listen to another thing I've got to say. Because you are a brainwashed liberal. Amen. Amen. It's the truth. Uh, I saw a thing yesterday of all of the new mosques that are popping up just in the state of Florida. And you would be amazed at how they're popping up all over Florida. Mosque. These people are, intended, are intent upon coming into this country and literally taking this country over by breeding and by coming in, by immigration. Of course, you've got a president. Thank God's only got six months left. You've got a president who is doing everything he can to swing the doors open wide and bring them in. And one of the, and one of the, a little ray of hope, just a small, but a ray of hope has just come down from the Supreme Court of the United States that said, Mr. Obama, you overstepped your bounds and violated the Constitution of the United States of America with your executive order giving amnesty to all of these illegal aliens. You overstepped your bounds. And of course, he's very angry about that, and so are the globalists and the one-worlders, because they want to take the sovereignty away from the United States of America, just like they were taking it away from Great Britain. Here's the ray of hope. I see a lot of people waking up. They're finally waking up. They're finally beginning to see what I'm talking about. A lot of them bought in to the lie that George W. Bush handed out after 9-11 when he gathered together the Muslim leaders in the country and some of those, uh, he didn't vet them very good. Apparently the group that called them in that did the vetting weren't two. One of them was a terrorist. But he gathered this group together and sat down. Then he got up and made this statement to the cameras in America and said, Islam is a peaceful religion. It's a religion of peace. That's sad. That is so sad. That is so, so sad. All he has to do is sit down for 30 minutes and listen to any college professor that no, that's worth his salt, and he'll tell him plainly that Islam has never been a religion of peace, that they have murdered and slaughtered people ever since that Muhammad showed up in the 5th century over there in, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. It's not. Now, there are many peaceful Muslims, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt about that. But you've got to understand something. They, how many of those peaceful Muslims have you ever seen in the streets marching against all of this murder and mayhem? They're taking Yazidi girls, Yazidi. How many of you know what a Yazidi is? I talked about them before. They live over there around Syria in that area. They're not Christian. They're not Muslim. They borrow from a number of religions. They go all the way back to Jethro in the Old Testament. These Yazidis, these young women... They would, not have, uh, what, they would not yield to the demands of these Muslim murderers uh, sexually. And so they took them and put them in cages. They took these young girls and put them in cages and burned them alive. Now that's a fact. That's a fact. You know, that's, that's an indisputable fact. And they would burn you alive if they could get you uh, and, 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 and in, into a cage like that. And if the time ever comes, they'll let you know what they are and what they're made of. You saw that in, down here in Orlando, Florida, when, when one went into a, a club down there and shot 49 people to death. And uh, I don't, how many of you know what weapon he used down there? I've never found out what he used. What weapon? Pardon? Say again now. A what? A SIG. Similar to the AR-15, M-16. Well, I understand that. 223 caliber, 5.56. I understand all of that. And he reloaded 20-round, 30-round magazine. 30-round magazine. Emptied a 30-round magazine, reloaded. Empty a 30-round magazine, reloaded. Empty a magazine, reloaded. I don't know what's going on between the time that he emptied it and reloaded it. He also had a Glock. And he had a Glock. 9 millimeter, 40 caliber, 45? 9 millimeter Glock. All right. Well, the, that's the, point. the point is that immediately they, they come out and they start this thing about the AR-15. All right. 
And one politician said all it would took, all it would have taken, all it would have taken is just one man, one man with a nine millimeter. It doesn't have to be a cannon, a nine millimeter. One man with a nine millimeter would have stopped that murderer right in his tracks. So how come nobody had one? Well, it probably has to do with the laws down. Say what? I didn't hear that. <laughs> but, okay. Hello. <laughs> Say what he meant in there. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, women can handle guns. You better believe it, they can. Uh, well, <laughs> but it probably was. I think it was during Rico. Yeah, that's the point. See, that's the point. That's the point. That's what this is about. <laughs> well, let's see. Is it against the law to murder people? Yeah. How, many, how many believe that? Yes, sir. All right. If it's against the law to murder people, don't you think that a man that is going to go in there and murder you, do you think he cares what your gun laws are? No. But you know who obeyed the gun laws? The sheep. The victim. They obey the gun laws, not the murderers. And the murderers never will. The killers will never obey the gun laws. So who are they making the gun laws for? The sheep. You. The victim. The gun laws are all about how they are going to control your access to a weapon that could save your life. And that, that you talk about uh, the uh, Democrats go up here and they sit down and they, they have a sit down. They finally did something. <laughs> They did something. They sat down. Yes, sir. Well, if the, the bottom line is the laws are designed to protect the elite. They've got their guns. They've got their guards. They've got their gated communities. Believe me, they are protected. And so the gun laws are designed to control you. And that's why the NRA is standing firm, and I'm glad they are. And I'm one of the members, and Hillary Clinton said that the NRA is her enemy, and the members are her enemy, so I'm Hillary Clinton's enemy by her statement, Amen. not mine. I never one time ever said that I was Hillary Clinton's enemy. She's an American citizen. Pardon? Well, I agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, her blood's no better than my blood. But the point is that the people in America are not stupid. They know that they need a weapon to defend themselves. They know at 2 o'clock in the morning if they kick your door down, you don't have time to call 911. It's time to do something about your home and your family. You ought to get the American Rifleman. Of course, I guess you have to belong to the NRA to get it. But there's a page in the American Rifleman, which is the oldest publication in this country that deals with weapons. Every month, there is a full page in the American Rifleman that gives you story after story after story after story after story after story of how people defend themselves with weapons. They take care of their babies, their wives, their husbands, their children, their homes, their jobs. They use weapons to do that. Does CBS report on that? When's the last time you saw a documentary from ABC on how that gun ownership in America has saved countless thousands of lives? No, but you will see them go the other direction, how that we need to control gun ownership. Now, here's the point. The Second Amendment makes America different. They want America to be just like Great Britain or to be just like France or to be just like Spain or Portugal or Italy, or Greece, or Germany, or any European country. They won't, and like Australia, for example. You know what they did in Australia? They gathered up all their guns, sawed them up, and destroyed them. They took their ability to, depend, to, to protect themselves away. Who in the world is a politician that thinks they have that kind of authority? You know, 
You know what? You, you know what ought to happen in this country? There ought to be a class action lawsuit. You know what a class action lawsuit is? <clears throat> it's when you have a bunch of people with the same complaint, and you get a lawyer, and that lawyer represents all these people. They may be some from Tennessee, from Georgia, Alabama, and so forth. But that lawyer represents all these people, and he files a class action suit against whatever party it is, and he represents all these people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they filed a class action lawsuit against all the politicians of America that were responsible for the bloodshed, innocent people dying at the hands of these murderers, like that woman out there in California? on the dock when this murder, when this illegal alien went out there and Kate Steinle and shot her to death right there for apparently no reason. A young woman died right there before her daddy. She said, oh, daddy. She cried out for her father. She said, oh, daddy. Cried out for her dad and this murderer had just shot her to death. Just shot her to death right there on the street. Didn't know her from Adam. It, isn't it a shame that you can't take the mayor of San Francisco or you can't take the alderman, the city councilman of San Francisco and put them up in front of a judge and say, which one of you is responsible for this woman's blood? Because your gun control laws killed her. You say, well, it would be like going back to Dodge City. They were safer in Dodge City than they are in, 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 in Chicago right now. They all had a 45 uh, 1873 peacemaker strapped on their side, or they might have been something beforehand, and, and they're carrying a Winchester in their hand and, and a shotgun. And, and you know, if these murdering Muslims, you're not going to stop them from killing people. You're not going to stop them from killing because they think by killing you, they martyr themselves and go to heaven. But it's for certain that if people were armed, when they come into a place like that, they're not going to kill near as many as they are now. 49 people. You think about that for a minute. I mean, that's just, and, and I mean, and, uh, up here in, uh, in the, where is it, Newtown, Connecticut, this, this insane, crazed boy walks in there, and he had an AR-15, didn't he? And he goes in there, and he starts shooting these little innocent children to death. At least that's, that's what they say, little children. There should have been some teachers in there that had blown him away before he ever got that far. Maybe he would have gotten into one classroom, and when they heard the gunfire, he might have killed two or three of those kids, but he would have been shot dead before he got any further. Now, that's what you heard at Temple Baptist Church, Preacher Lawson, on uh, June. Uh, I, here's my problem. I'm simple. My problem's simple. I'll be 70 September the 17th. I've lived long enough in this world. I, I, I've been flim flam too many times. I know what's going on. I know what's happening. Lock and load. Keep your powder dry. <laughs> Take that weapon, learn how to shoot it. Know how to hit what you're shooting at. And, uh, and uh, you, the day may come when you need to, uh, when you need to do it. Oh, preacher of the Lord said, turn the cheek. Turn to Luke 22. He turned the cheek in the kingdom of heaven. But when it comes to living in this age of grace that we're living in right now, he said, he said to them, have you got a cloak? Yes, Lord, we've got one. Sell it and buy a sword. When's the last time you ever heard a preacher preach on that? <laughs> Sell it and buy a sword. I was reading a commentary the other day by, one of the, by a very well-known comment, uh, commenter about that text right there. And he said, there is no way he said that. This is a gloss. A gloss means that it's something that's been added into the text. He said, my Lord Jesus would not say something like that. He, read, he did. He said that. I thought to myself, what do you base that on? Now, I can go back here in my office, and I've got a little book. It's about this big, about that wide, about this, this little, about that wide. It's called Nestle Allen's Critical Apparatus. Now, most folks never heard of that, but I'm going to tell you what it is. It takes every word in the New Testament that you've got in your hand, your Bible, every word, every word, and it traces the authority for that word through all of the possible unctuals and cursives and lectionaries and all of the material that's available to the church that has been for 2,000 years, it tells you whether or not it was in this or it was in that, it was left out of this, it's over here, it's in this, in that. And if you're going to create a Greek text, you need that because if you're going to create a Greek text, you need to know the authority for your Greek text, right? That's what a critical apparatus does. 
I'll bet you a dollar. Well, I won't bet a dollar. I'm going to do that in church. Somebody, somebody said, preacher's gambling. <laughs> But I haven't looked, but I can take you to that critical apparatus, and I can open it up to Luke chapter number 22, and I'll bet you that there is absolute, ample authority for what the Lord said about selling your cloak and buying a sword. You better believe it. You better believe it. So what does that mean? That comes down to Bible interpretation. That's what it means. So they've drawn out. They've, 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 they've taken themselves out of the European Union. They're angry about it. The globalists now, watch them, watch them now. This is, a, this is a very important time. The globalists are going to be watching this thing, and I don't know what they intend to do. I was watching Angela Merkel, Merkel, who is the Chancellor of Germany the other day, when this happened. She was giving a speech, and I wanted to hear what she had to say, so I listened to every word she said. And she used a term that just about blew me off of the seat when I heard her say it. And I thought, I'm so glad you said it openly. I'm so glad you said that. And here's what she said. She says, we will not, and I'm paraphrasing her, of course, we will not be deterred in our efforts toward globalization. I thought, oh, boy, nothing like confessing it over, nothing like saying it out, there, nothing like saying it. In other words, we will not be deterred in our efforts to bring about a one-world government that fulfills the prophecy of Revelation chapter number 13. Amen. How much more do we need? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yes, sir. I saw the stock market. And here's the thing about the stock market. Who's controlling the stock market? They are. They sure are. I wouldn't trust anything that comes off Wall Street. Say, so why not? Let me ask you a question. When Hillary Clinton went to Wall Street and spoke before these Wall Street bankers, these international bankers that made billions and billions and billions of dollars in the crash of 2008. Say, so how do you know they made that money? That money didn't, wasn't burned up, folks. It went somewhere. Did you get any of it? And she goes before them, and they want her to give speeches to them, and they pay her millions and millions and millions of dollars. And now she is embarrassed to death about it and trying to put a different spin on the fact that the Wall Street bankers paid her millions and millions and millions of dollars. What's that tell you? It tells you I'm going to tell you what it tells you. She's the one who said... We need to build bridges instead of walls, remember? In other words, Hillary Clinton is a globalist, a one-worlder. And so you need to keep that in mind. The EU pulling, the Great Britain pulling out of the EU is one of the most profound things that you've seen in your lifetime. And you're just now beginning to see the beginning of the ramifications of what's going to happen with that and what it means. So what does it mean, preacher? It may very well mean that the people are waking up and they're sick and tired of this one world globalist PC religion being rammed down their throats and they're going to do something about it when they go to the polls. Wouldn't that be wonderful to stop them in their tracks? Yes, ma'am. The Electoral College. Well, you know, if it, if it came down to uh, altruism, you'd come along and you'd say, well, I, my government is an honest government and I trust my government and they'll, they'll check, they'll, they'll count our votes and, 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 and it will matter. But on the other hand, I'm just like you, I'm a skeptic. I don't trust them. I agree.
Pardon? Yes, sir. That's what they're telling us. Right. 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 So what does that say to you? Bottom line is, like our lady says, your vote doesn't count. That's exactly what that says. Yes, sir. One thing that they all kept requesting from Great Britain is the number of people that showed up. It's 70% showed the vote. So that's the problem with the polls. Is you, you, you can't tell. So, like, for instance, in the primary process with, with, uh, with Trump, they have a record number of people that showed up to vote for Trump. So that bodes well for the actual nation coming out to vote for him. Because people are angry. He sure did. So the same trend is going on now that we see back then in Andrew Jackson's administration. And whose picture did, did they just take off the twenty dollar bill? They sure did. Globalists don't like Andrew Jackson. I mean, that's, <laughs> like our sister said a minute ago, there weren't any men in that, <laughs> in that, in that room down there. Uh, Now, here's what all of this I see happening with all this. The millennium is coming soon. If the Lord comes back, it's only seven years before the millennium. All right? If the Lord comes back and gets us today, we got seven years of tribulation, time Jacob's trouble. That is the realignment of the nations. That's when the nations make their decision. During that period of time, are you going to support Israel or are you going to turn against them? And so what's happening in America right now and what's happening in Great Britain right now, remember, Great Britain was the one who, who it, God used Great Britain to allow Israel to become a nation again. Put it that way. I don't know how to say it. He used Great Britain to do that. And uh, the alignment of the nations right now, they're getting ready to, to determine who's going into the millennium as a, the sheep on the goat, the sheep on the right hand, the sheep nations. The United States is going to have to make a decision. It's going to have to make a choice. And it's going to have to choose. And so watch it. Watch what's happening. Watch the politicians. Watch, watch what's going on in this country. Because what's happening right now is very critical and very important about the survival of the United States of America. Now, I don't want to make you mad this morning, but God's not an American. And he's not a Baptist. No, he's not. He's not an American and he's not a Baptist. He's the, he's, the, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And, uh, and I hope my nation, I hope my country makes the right decisions and supports Israel. For the last seven years, we have had the most anti-Israel president. And we've had some bad ones in the past. But this one right now, we've had seven years of the worst anti-Israel administration this nation has ever had. And if you've kept up with anything... That should be obvious to you. So watch that. That's important. That's a big deal. We'll see how, we, we, how, how the nation's going for the millennium. And in the millennium, 
If you're a born-again believer here today, in the millennium, you will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll reign with Him. And if you, are, uh, if you are reigning with Him, you'll be reigning with Him over these sheep nations, the nations on the right hand that go into the millennium. Amen. And that may, uh, that may very well uh, be that uh, God has something special in store for you. Amen. Suffer with me, you'll reign with me. And that's where we are right now. I don't know of anything that has to happen right now anymore for the coming of the Lord Jesus. I really don't. No signs need to happen. The gospel doesn't have to be preached to the ends of the world for the Lord to come back. That has to do with the end of the tribulation, not the church age. He can come at any moment. As a thief in the night, he could come and catch us up to meet him in the clouds. Hallelujah to God. I'm excited about it. I really am. I got fired up over that. I said, good for you, Brits. Wave that Union Jack. But of course, you know that, our, that Scotland now, the first minister of Scotland is saying that the people of Scotland had a referendum a couple of years ago. And in that referendum, they voted to stay in the United Kingdom. But since Great Britain has made their choice to remove themselves from the EU, European Union, Scotland is going to have to reassess their position as they relate to Great Britain. And the way she's talking, Scotland is going to pull out of the UK and, 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 and strengthen their ties with the European Union. And we've got other nations right now that are talking about pulling out of the EU just like Britain did. They're out there talking now. And what, Texas? Texas is going to... Texas is going to move out of the United States. <laughs> it's one of only two states of all the states that ever had a president. <laughs> uh, they had a, there was a sovereign nation at one time. And those Texans down there, they're not happy about this, about what's happening in this country. And, uh, you know, it was Texas, I think, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, has got uh, something like, what, eight, nine, ten uh, economy in the world. Something up there in the top 10, I think. And I'm talking about a state with an economy that's in the top 10 in the whole world. And, and the economy in Texas is on fire. Those people are at work down there. They've got jobs. And the thing seems to be going pretty good in Texas. And here's what the point is. Uh, federal government, don't tell us how to run our state. And you're over, a, you're over <laughs> everything you touch is failing and Texas is winning. So... Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, proposing secession, uh, don't need to. Just a few months back, some of you may not know this, but just a few months back, uh, some of those New England states were threatening to secede. New England states now, we're not talking about Alabama and South Carolina, and Texas and Tennessee and Georgia and all that. We're talking about New England states were threatening to secede from the Union. Now that's a mess. <laughs> that's something to think about. All right. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get back into this next week. We'll get back into some study about some things here too. I think they're very important. Father, thank you for the time we've had together in studying the Scripture. I pray I've said something useful this morning. I pray I have. In Jesus' name, amen.